Okay, we're recording the meeting because I uh, will probably take just a few notes and uh, we will be able to send the meeting also to uh, uh, Jeffrey, who actually um, be in Shenzhen with something that sounds like cold or flu symptoms is currently at the doctor being checked. Um, and uh, my heart goes to him because it's probably extremely stressful. So this is not going to be a very long meeting. I can see that we have a subset of the group. I guess I would call it it's quality, not quantity. Um, there's been a lot of stuff happening in our little, in, it's very funny because coin in French is corner. So I think in our little corner of the world, there's, there's lots of stuff happening. There's a lot of good work being done. And I think um, Jeffrey, Eve, and I wanted to have this uh, interim to um, make uh, some statements about what is happening. Uh, we are still um, very much, uh, I would say, still in a, uh, a startup mode. Uh, we are looking for new work. And I forgot to mention security, but I'm going to add it when I speak. Uh, we are obviously preparing for, for Vancouver, uh, although the hackathon is not the big um, uh, point of this group, it's still, I think, a fantastic way of getting together with the other groups. It's probably the only time uh, during uh, IETF, IRTF, where both the research groups and the engineering groups can meet and, and share. So I, I think the participation to the hackathon is as much for a face-to-face -face social uh, interaction as much as doing great code. Uh, so you can go through the next slides, which is all the um, um, the policies, the intel property, and the the goal, uh, you know, the harassment and everything. So this is an interim meeting. It is recorded. It has been planned, so it is considered a proper meeting. So uh, you can go to the agenda, please. Uh, yeah, the gold book, so that's it. Okay, go, well, yeah, we can just reply. This is actually, yeah, the, the, the previous ones, you know, Cohen is still looking at um, everything that's happening in the, uh, the computing and the network. Uh, and as I said, for me anyway, for the, in the past three months, there's been so much activity. There's been so much uh, work being done that is related. And while I think that when we started this, uh, this group, there was a strong link on, uh, you know, what are we going to do with the data centers and the, and the edge? Is it going to be both? Is it going to be in between? Is it going to be just uh, switches for filtering in the P4 world? But I think that more and more than we're looking into this, there is an extreme uh, move right now to distribute the t networking with computing capability all around the network. So this is uh, something that is impacting us, but in the positive in a positive way. There's an awful lot of activities, and I think one reason uh, we call the, you know we call the ourselves for people who are new on the list, we call ourselves the Gems, uh, which is Jeffrey, Eve, and Marie Jose. And uh, the reason the Gems wanted to have this interim was also to to put a status uh, on what is happening. Okay, next, next. So I want to have very uh, briefly, or we want to have very briefly, a review of the milestones. I just kept the ones that we have not achieved, the ones for this year. I think for Vancouver, something that we could do is to start thinking of new milestones, again, because of the uh, incredible amount of work that is being done in the research community on things that relate to what we do. Uh, I want to do a draft update. We have a number of active uh, uh, drafts. We have a few that are expired and uh, at least one that, although it's expired because of somebody getting a job elsewhere, uh, I don't know what's going to happen to it. And we have one new uh, draft that actually emerge from some work uh, on IoT at the European Union. Uh, we want to do some a review of the potential new work. And again, what's happening in meetings and conferences, I can see that a lot of my co-chairs of a number of places are, are on the call. 
uh, we want to do the hackathon preparation and that I think I will leave Eve to talk about some of the ideas she had um, and uh, also like what we want to do at the Vancouver meeting um, and I requested more time so that this time we will have time to go through um, a lot of the actions that we have for people who just joined uh, welcome to the we'll come to the call and um, we will um, go through the agenda now. So next slide. So this is from the data tracker. Um, the, the ones for 2019, we achieved them, which was like define what we want to do a little bit and you know get this group organized. Uh, so now for April, which is um, the Vancouver meeting, uh, we have three milestones which is identify coin uh, related ecosystem dependencies. And this is actually looking at some of the use cases. Uh, we had a number of uh, drafts that were for that, two are expired and there's a new one. So I think we're progressing on this, but obviously there's uh, more work needed. Uh, the case studies again is that, um, it's related to the previous one and the, the the one that I think that we need to really focus on maybe is, and uh, Eve, you can, uh, this is actually also part of, of your list of, of, of to-dos that, that you suggested, so interrupt me anytime. Uh, we want to discuss and catalog some of the coin requirements and the implications for the network elements. Like I said uh, in my little intro, uh, we uh, had at the beginning, you know, we're talking almost a year and a half ago, which seems, seems to be like the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, we were mostly looking at, uh, you know, implications in data center, a little bit of edge. And as this uh, paradigm is, is evolving, um, and we even start seeing hop by hop uh, protocols more and more, um, the this distribution of computing and networking is is very important, and I think this is probably the milestone that will probably not be achievable by April, but I think could be a focus uh, for the meeting in Vancouver. Uh, comments from anyone? I got you quiet. Uh, so, we're here. We're still here. Yeah, I'm waking I know. up. I'm still waking up. Okay, well, yes, I think, I, I don't know who else is from California, but, you know, we have to have kudos to Eve for, for supporting this at 6.30 in the morning. Um, so, and I think it's not for today's meeting to, um, to decide, but uh, maybe also regarding the new work and regarding the evolution, maybe we want to start thinking of new milestones because the other one, uh, that we have is, is a very generic one that I think we had put last year when we uh, started uh, the group. And I think we may want to have, now that we're legit, um, to have uh, milestones further down uh, in 2021 and further out. And um, again, this is not for today unless someone has an ID for a milestone that we should add today. But I think this is something that we should have on our um, on our list of things to think about and things to do. Uh, and again, look at the evolution of the work from currently uh, defined uh, the drafts. As we, as we said before in this group, is that the drafts are not the only output of this uh, of this research group, we also want to encourage presentation from the research community, even if it is, uh, you know, conference papers and stuff like that, to make sure that we stay really up to date uh, with what's happening outside, uh, outside our group and be able to better link to the other uh, conferences and other meetings that are related to us. So I, I think this is an action item for everybody. Uh, you know, review what we have and uh, please think of new potential milestones that we should uh, be discussing in Vancouver. And again, I'm going to come back to that, but I managed 
or I've requested to have more time in Vancouver so that we just don't have to rush through presentations, but have time to discuss things like the milestones and, and the evolution of the work. Comments from anyone? <clears throat> okay, next slide. Okay, so these are uh, the active uh, drafts. Um, there was a new version of the edge data discovery, uh, which was one of the earliest ones, but now has a new version. Uh, Eve, do you want to say something about it? I would say that it was largely cosmetic. There were a couple of paragraphs that changed. I think we were wanting to not um, have it be expired, um, but uh, uh, I would, I, what I'm hoping is that there'll be a more substantial change um, before the next meeting. You know, one of the questions that Dave had in his very thorough view of the document early on was, why focus on edge data discovery? Is there something more comprehensive from a life cycle standpoint that we could, you know, maybe that, that should be the focus of the draft. So I, that is, that's the key point for discussion with, the, um, with my uh, co-authors is, do we, make that, do we make that shift or not? So that's under review. Um, okay, um, other, uh, okay, the next one is the industrial use cases. We have one of the authors on the call. Uh, would, uh, would you like to say something, uh, Ike? Um, yeah, actually, we're um, thinking about extending that draft or maybe submitting a new one because we're now thinking about um, adding in some aspects about um, intrusion detection. Um, so we've got a new colleague working here at our chair, and yeah, we'll, we are still in discussion whether we want to simply extend the security paragraph of uh, that draft or whether we want to do uh, an additional draft about that. Okay, um, nice. The, uh, so you have the next two ones anyway, so that's fine. Uh, the directions for computing and the network we do not have. Uh, anybody uh, from the authors list, but I understand that this is, um, you know, progressing. And again, um, it helped a lot uh, focusing uh, some of the ideas that we have. And so I, I expect this uh, to be um, continuing. Um, and uh, you know, we one thing that I think in in Vancouver, in Vancouver that we think that we're going to start having is maybe uh, accept at least one of these drafts as research group drafts, and, and this one is high on the list. So we will have you know a vote on this when everybody is there. The the requirements for computing in the network. This is actually a like a subset of what's above. Uh, I think this one, again, we do not have any of the authors uh, on the call. Um, it, this one is, I think, a more uh, in-progress type work, and uh, we will make sure to uh, talk to the authors about how to make this uh, evolving into something a little bit more consistent. Right now, it is a very generic list of, of requirements, and it would be great for uh, the authors to focus on things that are specific to um, um, telecom operators since they basically uh, work a lot with China Mobile. Next slide. So the expired, uh, there's one of mine, and I'm working with um, Alex, Alex Fayev, and Yisha Shang to make a new version. So this should be uh, reinstated. Uh, uh, the next one was Jeffries. I, I think he will not continue this, but since he's not on the call, I cannot talk to him, but I had understood that they were not going to continue that. And the last one is a little bit like a, a, a in um, like an ill limbo one, uh, Dirk Trossen, who is actually one of the main author on this, has left InterDigital and is not working for Huawei. So I don't know if, uh, and we will communicate with, he started I think last week or something like that, 
um, I want to communicate with him and the other authors uh, to see what they're uh, going to, um, to, what they want to do with this, if they want to continue it or discontinue it or change the authors. Um, and this is actually a, a, um, something that we need to uh, review. There's a new one that's going to be presented. Actually, there's two new ones. Uh, there's actually, we have uh, one of the authors of the first one, Alessandro Bassi, on a reference architecture for Agriculture 4.0. He, Alexandro, had made a presentation in, um, in Singapore. Um, and now we're, uh, I'm, I'm actually a co-author also on this, but it's mainly his work. Um, we're, he's doing actually the, uh, the, the basic agriculture. Um, Alessandro, do you want to say something about it? Just follow from in the the the, the, um, uh, the presentation that I gave in, uh, in Singapore. So basically, is putting those concepts into paper, and uh, and just to show, I mean, how the computation of the network, I mean, can be helpful in in these circumstances. I mean. Okay, um, and I now have to say that it is actually related to the next one, which is. Uh, to come. Um, I don't know if anybody, no, there's nobody from Ericsson Research. Um, there was a, um, a proposal at the European Union on the use of uh, next generation IoT and a large number of use cases. And there was a recognition uh, with Ericsson Research and Dirk uh, Kutschner was also involved in this, as well as the people from Intel Germany and um, that there was this idea of a common data layer, this horizontal horizontalization of the computing and the network into layers. And uh, this common data layer is interesting because it allows to address things like uh, data formatting, data structures, uh, advanced distribution, cognitive networking, and of course, security. <laughs> which was, uh, if some of you remember, one of the uh, major uh, comments uh, that we got from our IAB review. Um, so it, I put it as to come because I'm actually right now in the process of recruiting authors for this because there was a lot of really good efforts made uh, in the um, in the proposal and independently of this, if this is accepted or not, actually distilling the common data layer out of that is actually, I think, a very good idea and can show that rely, it, it actually makes all the silos uh, that are currently part of IoT and a lot of uh, communication system being connected together and connected together very, very close to where the, the uh, use case or the application is being uh, activated or consumed. So uh, this is to come. And I think, uh, Marie Jose, that this is exactly along the lines of the comment that came back around the edge data discovery um, proposal. Oh. Um, because if you think about it, you know, we're, we're focused on finding the data, but that's one, only one part of, um, you know, finding data so that you can marshal it for um, to ready it for a computation that may be placed somewhere, um, and how do you do that coordination, for example? That, that was the thinking behind the edge data discovery draft. But then there's the equally important: okay, you you have this computation, and what happens to it? Uh, what happens to the output of that? How do you yeah. name it? How do you maybe cache it in multiple places? How do you you know how do you um, decide what's the best trans transcoding for it or transformation of it in order for it to be most accessible, et cetera. So I think that these have common issues. And um, so I am raising my hand to say, yes, I'd like to be part of that conversation um, okay. and see how we can, uh, if not create a new, um, well, I, I don't mind if we create a new draft, but to coordinate when we're doing that. Yes. And I actually, uh, 
part of what the questions were like, yeah, how do you discover, how do you coordinate, how do you orchestrate, how do you make sure that it's secure, you know, there's a bunch, actually, if I have the, the proposal we did um, and, and the discussions we've had with, with uh, Ericsson and with Dirk is like, we have a, a whole bunch of questions and the discovery is part of it, so yes. And um, so I, I think this is interesting because also, and, and you know, we have Ike on the call and again, Alessandro is also there. Uh, these are basically discussions that were raised by this idea of the use cases in manufacturing and agriculture and transportation, where there is a functional distribution between uh, cloud, um, cloud infrastructure and edge infrastructure and a bit of in between, and it goes into distribution of cognition also and all kinds of stuff. So I think this could be maybe at one point even more than one document, but let's let's see what we have. And it has raised a lot of interest anyway, so um, I think it's there. Uh, there's a bunch of people on the call uh, that could have other ideas. And uh, again, um, these are the ones that exist or some of the ideas that are there, but there's other, uh, there's other work being done in, in related uh, fora. Actually, the common data layer is also very much related to things that are happening in things to things, for example, um, and even in named function networking. So there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, common interest there. And if anyone on the call uh, or in your research uh, groups have other related ideas that you think uh, could be interesting, um, please submit them. Again, um, I'm going to talk about, you know, what's going to happen in Vancouver. It doesn't have to be a draft if you just want to have uh, a presentation. Uh, one thing that we have started looking at, and I see Frank is on the call, is this idea of critical information uh, inside uh, computing in the network. So by computing, we may want to identify critical information and that information may need to uh, be transported with some kind of FEC or some kind of coding. Uh, this is something that uh, we started talking to um, with my other group, actually, the network coding group uh, with uh, the people from the University of Louvain. Um, and, and that could also lead to more things in the common data layer. So the criticality of information is, I think, also something that is very important for us. So um, again, um, good ideas are welcome, and uh, the good ideas are not the chair's ideas. So um, please, um, please be welcome in submitting ideas. So anybody has a comment further? This is going to be a short meeting. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so this is related to what just I said. So potential new work, we have obviously a use case for um, um, IoT. I talked about common data, the common data layer. Um, there's um, some ideas in distributed cognition. This is actually uh, from Ericsson Research and both in Ericsson Canada. I'm supposed to talk to them, uh, for the Canadian part, tomorrow. Uh, but it is uh, something that is strongly related to the uh, some of the XR issues also. So uh, XR being extended reality. Um, so this is something that could uh, lead to uh, more work. Uh, Roberto Morabito, who is part of that Ericsson research uh, team, is currently in Princeton. So he's talking to all the, the right computing and the network people. And uh, that could be also something that's going to happen. Uh, tactile internet, I am not seeing uh, Fatan Jani from uh, Ecole de Technologie Supérieure here in Montreal. I'm actually in Montreal right now, waiting for a snowstorm. Um, and uh, all flights are canceled tomorrow. And uh, so uh, tactile internet, and I would say other alternative internet approaches um, are um, also part of things that we we can look at because, again, of the necessity of the necessary uh, uh, disintermediation of the functions and the location of their uh, um, operations. Um, I know there's other people from, I would say, 
the alternative internet architectures beyond uh, ICN, which is very much related to what we do, uh, but people related to um, other approaches um, to uh, new ways of looking at the internet. And um, there's a meeting in France, I'm, I'm mentioning NEPROC, uh, where these people are going to be there, and I think there's going to be uh, discussions there, people related to RENA and also the NET2030. Um, and um, I will have a, a shout out to my co-chair um, in NETPROC, um, Eduardo Jacob, who um, has been immensely useful for this. So uh, related meetings, this is my list. And actually, one thing that I would like to submit to the, to the, to the list and to this group currently today, so raise your hand if you agree, um, I think it would be good to have some kind of a, um, you know, part of the wiki, but maybe part of the GitHub, a list of conferences that we know are related to this. Um, we all are involved. We all have our own uh, list of, of conferences that we attend to, that we're aware of. And I think it would be nice to, um, um, to have a list of those, not just because uh, it's fun to have, but also it would be a good way to um, communicate uh, the ideas of the group, recruit more people to the group, and make sure that you know we're all in, in on the same page. So um, it's not done, but I think it's something that um, Eve, Jeff, and I could start and you know ask the list uh, for other ideas. Uh, so I mentioned NetProc. That proc is in about now three weeks. Uh, it's in Paris. It's part of something that's called ICIN, which is a you know conference on computing. Where there's going to be also a, a panel at the end on on things related to computing in the network. Uh, NetProc right now is very small. Uh, we have a number of papers, but we also have a P4 hackathons last tutorial. Uh, it was the first year it was um, organized, and I think it's going to be going to be nice. I like small conferences. There's a DAG tool seminar uh, uh, in March, and uh, Dave and Eve and I, and probably a few other people on this list. I don't know if Colin's going, but you're welcome. You know, I think it would be nice. Um, and a bunch of people who are part of what I call the the current you know team of uh, drafts authors. Dirk Trossen, Jorg Ott, and everybody are going to be there. It's actually on compute-first networking, which is one way of looking at computing in a network. Uh, these seminars are cool because it allows people... Um, okay, so Colin, you won't be there, but we, we'll take good notes. Um, and um, it, it, those seminars are really cool because they allow people to really get together and be immersed for a few days um, in, into a specific topic. And they publish some, you know, nice uh, notes and stuff. And uh, I think uh, Eve is one of the organizers, actually, with Dirk. And I think we will make sure that um, salient uh, outputs of this are going to be um, uh, published to the list. Um, I mentioned ICN 2020 just because I'm part of it, but also. Uh, because there's going to be, um, we want to extend a little bit out of uh, this year's conference, um, the concept of ICN and going a bit into what Eve was mentioning in terms of um, discovery and, and some of the things that we have uh, looked into even for the um, this idea of critical information where essentially who defines what is critical? Well, essentially, it's the users of the application or of the system and the interest data messaging in ICN and all the namespaces that were defined are really, really good for that. So we want to extend a little bit the, um, the focus of, of ICN 2020 uh, towards uh, these applications. Again, the other is for um, for us to fill, and um, I, we will create this this list and uh, make sure that the the whole community is um, is aware. Um, anybody else having something? 
Eve, you're going to talk very soon, so uh, I'm, I'm on my end of, of things. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry we, we will not have real presentations today uh, because we, first we didn't get some, and also um, I think it was more the goal of this pre this meeting was more to to put a status for everybody than than to have specific presentations. So next slide. Now I see only gray. Uh, yeah, sorry because I um I was queuing up my slide that I was um going to show. How's that? Are we back? Yeah, we're back. Okay, sorry. I was I have a slide I'll show and I need to forward this. Okay. Okay. So this is the now that now this is going to be Eve's show now. Um, so the goal of the hackathon, like I said, we 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 would like to have a common project, and this is what Eve is going to talk about. Uh, the goal is obviously looking at the architecture evolution and and some tools development. But this architecture evolution, essentially, also it's interesting to think about it when we're inside the hackathon because like I said at the beginning it is one of the few occasions inside uh, the IETF where all the groups can meet and you know there's cross table fertilization here which is kind of interesting so um, I will let uh, Eve talk about her multi-stream processing project okay so let me stop sharing this for a moment is are there more slides besides this I think there's only one for the. Would you want me to do the last one and then you talk about? Yeah, it? let's do that and because okay. I'll stop sharing this and then we'll come back to it. Okay. Okay. So again, Vancouver meeting. There's the hackathon. I requested two sessions, or we requested two sessions, because in the last two IETF, uh, we barely had time to present everything, and we didn't have time to talk about how we want this thing to evolve. And so, that's and that's a pretty common. Uh, way that things roll out is that we have these wonderful talks and then there's just not a lot of time for ruminating or for yeah. debating and it would it would be great to have some breather between um, topic times and get people's opinions and responses. Yeah, so, and that's why the first one would be on the research talks, the invite, some having some invited talks. Uh, current and research topics, so that would you know generate uh, discussions on where we want to go. Then have the actives and the new drafts, which then will be a shorter list, or maybe well, it's still is quite a lot. But also, I would say that having the research talks and the invited talks on one day, and then having the active and new drafts on another one, would also let people have the time, like what Eve said, to think about what's going on, and we will have time uh, to look at milestones and to. Uh, to reevaluate a little bit where we're going. Right. Um, and we'll try to schedule it in a way that makes sense so that we have presentations interspersed with discussion. Yes. And so, the logistics, well, for now, um, you know, please send us agenda items and your talks that you would like to do. And so Colin actually sent a message, I don't know if anyone wanted, but there were day passes available and if there's still some, but uh, if uh, you feel that you know, somebody uh, could would not come if they have to pay the whole thing or um, people from the West Coast of Vancouver are so close by. Um, so, uh, you know, students or things like that um, or y young researchers um, that sometimes don't have budgets, uh, that could be a way to get more people. Um, I think one goal of this group also, because we're like right now a little bit of, you know, <laughs> It was my phone, and it's it's the Thunderbirds, by the way. Um, and yeah, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of analog systems, so the Thunderbirds is perfect for me. Um, and uh, so, yes. Okay. Yeah, so Should just, I? To, just to follow up on that, there are a very limited number of day passes available. Uh, it's it's an extremely limited uh, set we have. So uh, uh, this is not a uh, we we can hand out free passes to everybody. Thing, unfortunately. No, no, no. I again. So um, tell those who you know. Tell your friends who are not uh, who might not be able to um, afford the registration, uh, particularly students and other researchers who might be ha might have limited funding that these are available, and that they're going quick. Yes. Uh, also, also for students, there is a, a very cheap rate to attend the whole ITF. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. 
Okay, so Eve, you can now talk about your. Okay, let me stop this. I want to show another. Okay, let's stop. See if I can uh, stop sharing, and then let me um, see if I do this again. I'm going to bring up a slide. Here it is. Let me know if you can see it, and I will put it in. I see it, and it's beautiful. Okay, so for those of you who might have uh, begun attending these meetings way back when we were in Thailand, um, I participated remotely, and I was representing, uh, I, in fact, that first, it was a BOF, it was a BOF meeting, and. Um, there was a lot of presentations about use cases with traditional, what I would call traditional flows of IoT information, which is data comes from the backend cloud and wends its way towards the edges of the network. Um, and I sort of showed up and said, well, one of the reasons why I think compute in the network is so interesting to me is that if you look at other use cases, a lot of data is getting created at the edges of the network and it aspires to um, be, you know, to send itself upstream. And uh, if every device that's part of some very large group is sending data, not just even control messages, but data upstream, there's an implosion problem. There's an even more pronounced implosion problem, which, voila, it, um, I had to use some French, Marie to say, um, <laughs> it, uh, it needs, it's very likely that you're going to need to scrutinize the streams that converge at various collection points um, to assess whether it's going to fit, all of that data is going to fit on the next hop um, going forward. And not only is it going to fit on the link, but it's going to fit on the computer, either in memory or in storage or on it, you know, its internal bus, whatever, whatever the case. So compute in the network has this, uh, you know, this role for these upstream flows um, to, you know, assess the resource availability. And um, it turns out that if you look at a lot of the immersive media work going on, or even the dense IoT work happening, you know, we've got so many dense uh, deployments of devices, whether those devices are cameras or sensors, um, that you know, in the aggregate, when they collect at points, there just there isn't enough room there. So, what are the kinds of functions that need to live at those aggregation points to do interesting things? Now, um, while I sort of introduced this case of these upward flows and you know this need for compute at those at those nodes in the in the very first BOF session, at a later session, um, I actually came in and. Um, talked about, um, you know, uh, I guess, and not only in the, again, you can hear I'm not quite awake. <laughs> it's still early for me, and I haven't had coffee, so I'm not finding my words. But um, I've also presented uh, this work not only in COIN, but in the ICNRG um, work around what we've been calling the ubiquitous witness use case. And this is the idea that in these dense deployments, um, there are so many witnesses to any event. So I, as a sensor, may sense something anomalous happening. And I, and I believe I've um, used the use case of, um, you know, in a smart city, there's a camera and something of importance happens like a crash in the middle of an intersection, which is actually where the bulk of most accidents happen or a very large percentage of them. And, you know, so it senses that, but by the way, so do all the other sensors nearby, whether they're cameras or vibration sensors, sensors or audio sensors, and they're all sending information to their anomaly detectors. And so the idea was for this ubiquitous use case, what are the kinds of functions that might, um, that you might perform at um, that collection point. So what I have here is um, uh, somebody's rebranded to Fino Switch uh, at the bottom, um, and it presumably has match action. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor moving around when I move it? 
Hello. I do. Okay, great. So, you know, it, of course, um, the programmability is all about these match action tables, at least from a, a programmable switch standpoint um, or a P4 standpoint. And um, I, we, I started a, um, a thread, uh, I think right before the last or maybe right after the last um, meeting, the last ITF around, what are the kinds of things that your switch do, what could it do to not only assess whether a single flow matches some rule, but could we have groups of streams, you know, have functions that are very deliberately looking at, in this case, I've just for example's sake, uh, A, B, and C, and I should probably show this more visually on this picture, but A, B, and C are streams, they're, they're flows, they're data flows coming through the switch, and I really want my my match function to be about, can you tell me if these streams are contextually related? And that begs the question, what, is, what does that mean? And, and so in this dense IoT deployment use case, it means um, that you might be proximate to each other and not only are you- Can I ask a real quick question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Who is me in that previous sentence? You said, can you tell me? Oh, uh, from the perspective of the switch, because this is, of course, going on in the switch. And this is a function, this is, um, I mean, and that's a, that's a great question. It's, these are match action functions that need to be installed. And so I guess the, the answer to the me question is, whoever's installed the match action function. Um, so, but it, you know, it may be an operator because what I'd, what I'd like to have happen is I'd like to provide a service. This is the use case that I've presented in the past. I'd really like to have a use case where I say, um, one, what are the flows coming through this switch that are proximate to each other that might qualify for a contextual compression, which is not, uh, and I use that term loosely because it's not compression in the sense of like, I'm gonna take my favorite encoding scheme and compress this, but rather, because of these streams being related to each other, and they might be providing me redundant information, I have this opportunity to say, only forward the information from the stream that has, and this is what I proposed on the list, you know, um, if I could ascertain that these, these streams were related, meaning they're sending me related information. You can, you can define contextually related in any number of, a number of ways, but in this use case, it's, how proximate are they to each other? Are those cameras pointing in the same place and have they captured, have they actually captured, you know, the jaywalker who was walking across the street that led to this accident in the middle of the intersection? Um, you know, something to that effect. And so I'm thinking about all the different things that once I've ascertained that, that these streams are related might be um, useful functions to match on. Um, so these were just, you know, top of mind uh, examples of what my um, match function might look like. But note, all of them are, are on these incoming groups of incoming streams. So again, I need to, I'll annotate this slide for our, um, our meeting in uh, Vancouver so that this is a little clearer. Um, these are on streams and uh, the, the switch is, needing to look a very likely, although not necessarily, very likely, I want it, certainly in the second example, to look into the packet beyond the packet header. So right now, it's often the case that what's happening inside of the switch is that it's got acceleration hardware for doing all the things that are typically done to packet headers as they come in. But really, a lot of the most interesting, not, I, well, sorry, my perspective is there's additional interesting work to do um, and could be defined as compute in the network that happens beyond the packet header. And so the, not only are we interested in groups of contextually related streams, but we're looking at wanting to process stuff beyond the packet header. You know, for, you know, is there a human in the frame? Is there an anomaly detector? You know, all of these things could be about information that's in the, you know, deep packet inspection. So, you know, I don't know how easy or hard that is to do because I don't really have my P4 chops yet. <laughs> but, um, 
but that's the thinking. And then the action might be something as simple as, um, uh, you know, oh, these things, you know, I want to process them together and I'm going to do more sophisticated things on them. Let's, you know, spin up a VM and do something more sophisticated with them. And we're using the switch to kind of identify um, collections of things. If you squint at that, that's a, that may look like, ooh, I'm forming this virtual edge cloud. Those, those streams qualify as some federation in its own right, and let's you know, do something uh, edge-like that uh, manages, for example, uh, I'm going to have uh, establish some policies that are related to those streams, or you know, I'm going to create, I'm going to um, identify where there's a trust anchor for them, or other forms of uh, security and privacy. Um, uh, for example, it may be the case that, oh, I've got these contextually related stream. Let's turn on that anomaly detector and so that I can come back and do some anomaly detection. Oh, and then there's anomaly detection. Let's turn on the, you know, human in the frame uh, finer grain anomaly detector or something like that. So, so you can see there's this, whoops, that was not what I wanted to do. Hang on. Um, so there's a whole collection of these functions that are circular or iterative, you know, one leads to the other, which comes back to a different kind of match. match. The match leads to an action, which leads to a match, which leads to an action, and so forth. So forth. Um, but uh, I'm also quite interested in, you know, if something happens that, that's anomalous, you can imagine in an industrial setting, that um, you might want to vault that data, or even in a setting where there's a business model around, oh, I, there's an insurance. Uh, somebody needs to, you know, uh, or there's a, a contract for a guaranteed quality of service that isn't met. Um, I want to vault the data so that I've got evidence, my ubiquitous witness evidence in the future of some uh, collection of data around a point in time and space. And then, you know, back to the immersive use case, uh, the immersive media use case, and um, I have in the past also commented on the very interesting work going on in the MPEG standards community around stitching together these disparate streams of flows um, to form something new, uh, which is, you know, 360 degrees. There, there are whole collections of um, formats and point cloud formats that are emerging from the MPEG I group. Um, but the, the idea is uh, I have all these streams, they're related if they're in the visual realm, and I could stitch them together or even to view partial 360 degree views, you know, maybe it's a 180 degree view, um, that would still allow me to walk around my data uh, it, after the fact and examine what actually happened. And so you can see that there's this, um, there's, there's no shortage of things that we could do for this kind of use case. The question is, is the switch up to it? Um, and what would, how, you know, do we, um, or, or is the, if it's not the switch itself, is there, are people interested in these kinds of use cases that might anchor a demonstration at a hackathon? I will stop here and kind of wait for your responses. So I have two quick observations. <clears throat> One is some things are convenient to do with the data flow model, which is what you're basically forced to do in a switch. Right. Um, and some things are not. And I think like a first order thing to try to do is to categorize those things because we have 50 years of history of what things work well in data flow models and which things don't. Uh, just from a computational standpoint. So maybe going back and looking at that kind of stuff would be useful. Um, right. A, a second thing, which, um, is hap which, ha which happens at much higher rate data rates than what we're talking about, is what the physicists have to do for uh, detector data in particle accelerators. Mm -hmm. Because they, ha they have to combine and throw away more than 99.99% of the stuff coming in. And figuring out how to do that um, without, you know, spinning special purpose hardware is, is actually very, very tricky. So there may, yes. learn, there may be some very, there may be some learnings there. Yes, I mean, that's a, that's a really great point because make no mistake, you know, I, I show a picture of a switch here because we have, at least in the past few hackathons, been um, catalyzed by looking at P4. And so this is more an entree to the discussion. But the question is, 
this is not just a software flow uh, or a programmability flow. This is, there are implications for the hardware, which are super interesting for the, um, uh, for the design of any kind of entity that lives at these aggregation points, because there is this close uh, partnership that has to happen between the router, the compute engine, and the storage that may not really um, exist as yet in something like the switch that I've shown here. I agree entirely with that. Yeah. The one caution I would give is that P4 is way more powerful than any switch today can do, and maybe way more powerful than any switch that looks anything like today's switches could ever do. Right, so maybe so it's- I think you, may, you really need to start with the hardware and not the programming language. I can do almost anything in P4 if I want to. Right, right. Um, but, you know, the, the point of this is to identify what can't the hardware do? I mean, so that's, we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, we've been, we've been thinking a lot about the programming, but it, I think some of the implications of the compute and the network are absolutely hardware based and they, um, they will lead to new kinds of um, architectures for how I, the three headed beast gets along. And I, and I refer to that as the compute, the networking and, and uh, the storage of the three headed beast. Um, and uh, whether it's, uh, that we're adding compute and storage to the, the networking elements or, and I know you've raised this in the past, Dave, or whether um, we're adding network elements and compute to storage or so forth, you know, it, these are probably, they're all valid forms of architectures, and, but they all are going to have this problem that they're going to want to take on uh, capabilities that live in the, the other two domains or the other two brains of that three-headed beast. So. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, right, I, I mean, I think you're exactly right on. The, the danger we, can, we, we follow is um, starting from what a switch can do, as opposed to starting from what our uh, architecture and protocol uh, designs ought to be for in-network computing. Well, I'm, I'm happy to, again, because this sort of came up in the context of the hackathon, could we come up with a project that was more long-lived that maybe, um, you know, for this kind of hackathon, the first thing that we look at is how easy is it to um, simply do the base function, which is uh, could, you, could the switch at line speed uh, tell me which things are contextually related and could we come up with a family of functions that do progressively more sophisticated um, uh, you know, functions around what does context mean? You know, it could just be an identifier inside of um, the packet header. Well, that's simple. The answer is yes. <laughs> but, you know, these more sophisticated ones, the answer is probably not. Now, um, the, I, to, another, to, to drill in a little further into the use case, and again, I can kind of present this in more detail in a, you know, when we, when we meet in, in person, uh, that, um, one of the interesting things about the MPEG-I standard is that it is, it's got a um, metadata uh, description for scenes. So, so if you think about what your camera's looking at and there's a scene description of the, the, what's in the frame, that's cool. Um, and, but, but you know, what does that actually look like? Well, you take a step back with all the objects that are in the, in the scene might have in turn their own descriptions. And so this starts to look like some of the conversations that are going on inside the thing to thing working group. Uh, the, some of, if anyone's been following the WISHY work, um, which stems from the workshop on, I can't even remember what WISHY stands for, but it was all about semantic interoperability. And there's been this great partnership between the ITS thing to thing working group, the OCF, um, organization and W3C and a whole slew of other IoT related standards uh, bodies and consortia to come up with one data model for like how do you represent data, how do you represent objects. Um, and so now you've got MPEG I, it understands, it's got scene intelligence, it can recognize if we throw some, you know, we, we can 
create bounding boxes around things and identify them as objects inside of these scenes. And um, each one of those objects in turn has, you know, its own meta information. And, you know, it starts to look a bit like the naming that's required for ICN or, or some other complex scene where data is related. Now, not everything in the scene is going to be going to have a digital, uh, is not going to have computation and communication capabilities, um, but some of them are. And it, it just becomes a very interesting way to link the visual realm to the, um, uh, the smart objects realm and um, kind of working backwards to figure out how do these digital cyber twins, uh, you know, that have a representation on the computer, then map back to the physical world. So there are lots of things that can come out of this, you know, it's sort of endless. Um, but in that case, I was thinking that it could have some nice implications for uh, linkages back to where the coin discussion even started, which is the thing to thing research group. So, um, so kind of to come full circle, um, is this, you know, sort of how do people think about centering at least one of the hackathon projects around a use case like this? Um, whether or not we tie it to a physical switch or whether, you know, all of this lives in software of some sort and we map it back to these, you know, what Dave was saying is, you know, what are these, the kinds of functions <clears throat> for contextually related data flows um, that are easy for certain kinds of hard, classes of hardware to do versus these newer functions that we're going to need something new for. So we could, we absolutely could go through that exercise, but I think it would be quite interesting. But that's me. What do, what do other people think about this as a, as a hackathon anchor to some of our work? Um, so Emil is there and Alessandro is there. And as the one who was there at the past two hackathons we had, I would say that what was done in Singapore, for example, which was, I would say, a single stream um, match and action. Actually, we have the code for that already because mm -hmm. this was done in Singapore, so there would be something to start with. Um, on the comment of David and also what you're doing, this idea of, you know, identifying um, a certain the anomaly detectors or identifying uh, information out of a huge amount of data. Um, the physicists have it even larger than most people, but Alessandro could say that, for example, in the agriculture use case, where there's going to be time series of pictures that are going to show infestations or the growth of the plants or whatever, there is also an awful lot of information. It's like big data, essentially. Mm -hmm. And 99% or even more than that it's just data that could be sent somewhere else and used to uh, train neural network algorithms. But they're not, you know, I mentioned the, the word critical, and they are not critical uh, at this point. They're part of, yes, the training. So this is what a, a nice plant looks like. And oh my God, now there is something that needs action. It still needs to be part of the training, but it also needs to be actioned on right now. So it's the anomaly detector, it needs to trigger something. So I think, yes, the implication in uh, MPEG is interesting, but I think the more, you know, the even more important one is this in-network in compute across contextually related data flow. And I think uh, based on what was done in the past two hackathons is something that uh, is a step further. Emil or Alessandro, you were there in Singapore. Do you have anything to add to this? Okay. They're on mute. I know, I know they're on mute. They may not know they're on mute. <laughs> I'm muted, right? <laughs> now you're unmuted. Me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, no, but uh, what you said is it's, uh, it's very true. I mean, related to the, 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 the data I mean, coming from uh, uh, different fields. I mean, agriculture is one of the example, but industry can be uh, can be a similar one, transportation or or whatever. I mean, smart city and so on and so forth. 
And indeed, I mean, that would be very, very interesting for me. Okay. So, um, I um, think what there's, I there's, a, there, there's another angle on, that I think we ought to be aware of. Um, Nick McEwen gave this fascinating talk at Hot Nets in, in November. And the bottom line of that talk is that servers are starting to have the same problem as switches. Because if you need to touch the data, everything falls apart very quickly at rates above 40 gigabits. So he's actually proposing new server architectures where you can't actually look at the data. You can only look at the packet headers um, in the servers um, and decide what to throw away and what to allow to flow through your cache into main memory. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of this recapitulated. And, and, and two, two, two things we really ought to think about are, number one, uh, the switch guys really don't care about anything but the highest rate data. Right? All of their energy goes into it. All of the money goes into it. All of the ASIC design goes into it. And we have tons of use cases that are two orders of magnitude below what those guys are looking at. Yep. And we can do tons of stuff in software and don't necessarily have to live with the restrictions of the way people build switches, which is to put a really fast forwarding ASIC on it and a CPU that's 10 years out of date. So I, I'm glad the group is taking this broader look at um, how to deal with computing in the network. Um, uh, and and we, we shouldn't forget about the vast majority of applications that do not require the highest speed tiers. No, but, and, and I think that's exactly what I said at the beginning, what I said, this has been an incredible evolution of the thinking of this group from the big, you know, from when we started thinking about it and, you know, I would say, well, poor Jeff is not here, but Jeff um, had more of a, a data center, you know, hundreds of gigabits per second or whatever. And uh, Eve and I were more like, oh, hold on, there's also a need to do things uh, at a lower speed. And I think both still live. And while the hackathon is still looking at what we can do with P4, um, we're not linked to it. You know, we're not wedded to P4. Yeah, I don't think P4 is the issue. No, I know. You can yeah. change the stuff in P4 that, that nobody's ever going to build a switch yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah. So, but what I'm saying is that I, I think, yeah, I think all these comments are good, but uh, maybe um, if, you know, I think, um, Eve, you should post this slide to the group and, and with a little bit of your ideas and okay. see how we could, um, we could do that. And like I said, there's already um, code uh, from the previous hackathon that does some of that. And also start a, a discussion on, yes, what it means to, to look at these uh, data flows, what it means when you start looking again just at the headers, or I would say a little bit beyond the header, I would say the header and the metadata, and not just, you know, the whole, we don't maybe need the whole payload to make a decision. Right, right. right. And actually, what I didn't get to was that um, it turns out, not surprisingly, that the MPEG I standard has, it creates, voila, metadata um, identifiers, so object identifiers. And so in the same way that we may have a port number or a source address or whatever, it's got metadata identifiers. And maybe what we could be doing is simply jumping into the packet and grabbing that metadata identifier to go, aha, you're looking at that thing too. You know, and, and okay, great, we're contextually related. So those are some of the conversations that we've been having internally around how to leverage um, a concise way to figure out um, whether we're looking at the same thing. And, Can and, I ask and, a and, question, Eve? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is going to show my total ignorance of MPEG I. Okay. And I MPEG is actually it. capable of creating common object identifiers across sources? No, no, that's that's what we're doing. <laughs> um, but uh, but reusing the identifiers. And so again, this has wonderful implications for 
you know, the, the magic of namespaces. And uh, could we could we leverage um, our expertise in na namespace design to do something intelligent in the MPEG world, or propose something, or demonstrate something? Um, uh, okay. Yes. Fine. No, no, no. no. Uh, Listen, we're saying take MPEG I as it is and figure out what we can yes. do with it. Because yes. I'm, the, not, I'm not nearly as optimistic as that. Right. But so this is. Um, but this kind of goes back to okay. Because MPEG I is in flight, just as the one data model work is in flight in the IoT, can these communities, which seem like pretty disparate communities, can we get some people like ourselves to straddle these worlds to influence one, the metadata model, two, how would it be easy to create to extract from these scenes, um, uh, create namespaces that um, are reasonable and processable and, you know, et cetera, and that fit into these models of um, networking like ICN and so forth. So, um, you, know, yeah. you know, another sort of thing right out of my rear orifice is that about eight <laughs> years ago, um, that was a great phrase. Adichia Kell and his group at Wisconsin um, came up with a scheme for fingerprinting video with similarity algorithms that actually represented similarity hmm. so that um, if you computed this at two different sources, it would come up with the same fingerprint if the two things they were looking at were sufficiently similar. That's excellent. That's and exactly You want to go yeah. back to that work. And, yeah. and so that's Aditya's work? Uh, yeah, it was, I don't, I, he, was, he was the PI. I'm not sure he actually did the work. Okay. Um, I, I, we, we should go do some forensics on um, video fingerprinting. Okay. Um, because that sounds more like what you're trying to do here in terms of um, being able to decide what to do with some video based on how similar it is to some video well, from a different source. Okay, but let me reframe this, uh, no pun intended. I uh, really, the, the thing that I think is important and I think where Marie Jose was going, when she was making reference to the previous hackathons and other people's work and code that we have already is this hackathon we should focus on what does it mean to be contextually related now if your data streams in the video realm great Aditya's work could be very useful but um, this issue of ubiquitous witnesses where we've got dense deployments where sensors are sensing the same phenomena we could come up with a whole family of contextually functions that qualify as contextually related functions, you know, functions that'll deduce whether or not some collection of streams flowing through your network element are contextually related. So, um, yeah, I, but I think, that, I think there's two, there, I mean, these may be extremes, but many of the cases in IoT are actually static properties, not dynamic properties, or quasi-static properties, which means that the configuration of the sensors doesn't change. The contextual um, relationship doesn't change. And that's not true for video. Um, you're right that they're gonna, there's going to be some classes of meta information that never changes. And then when we've got mobile things moving around or dynamic scenarios, yes, that part of the metadata space is going to be, you know, very hard to, um, to tame because you're, it's going to require you to, to do some computation on the stream before you can decide what the metadata is, you know, that you're going to plug into this function that's going to deduce contextual relationships. Um, so yes, so I think that's one important point that you, to tease out of this is, could we find interesting um, elements inside of the metadata that after some initial compute or even from the get-go are things that we could hang our functions on, meaning, you know, that's what we focus on to deduce contextualism. Um, and that would certainly speed things up. So, you know, that's sort of a meta problem for, for this is, is how do we create this family of functions that don't require us to perform compute every time? Because after all, these, it's certainly for these style of switches or network elements, they're not really designed with hardware that's going to be accelerated, that'll accelerate those sorts of functions, at least not yet. Um, so, yeah. So that, that, was, that was a good point that you made, Dave, about, you know, what things are we going to look into the packet stream and grab 
Uh, how easy will that be? And and that should be the focus of I think the hackathon is just to do something. Really, this is this is the big picture, but the small picture would be great. Let's work on um, functions, uh, some small collection of functions that'll uh, figure out whether these streams are contextually related that are flowing through the switch. Now, we don't really have a test bed that's going to allow us to do that, so we're going to have to simulate that. Um, uh, and I'm not exactly sure how we how we go about doing that. Um, well, I think I think that's what uh, I think would be interesting in starting a discussion on the list because the people who were really um, influential in the previous hackathons are not on well. Alessandro and Emil were there, but you know, the people from NoviFlow, the people from uh, the university in Singapore that did a lot of fantastic work. Um, the, the guy from the Netherlands, who I suppose was part of one of the telecom operators there. Um, they could all, they're on the list, so they could also have um, specific uh, ideas for this. And I have their names anyway, so we could even okay. pick them personally. So that's what I say. I think you need to capture um, what's on that slide, how it relates to um, a number of use cases. Uh, Alessandro is very big on these digital twins, uh, how we can look at that. I think, Dave, it would be great if you could post the, the, um, the, the paper that you were mentioning uh, to the list. Maybe you did, but since we're talking about it. Oh, and maybe. also... Um, the next thing or, or the stuff from... I have to do some forensics to find the old fingerprinting stuff. No, no, the, the, the paper you said was presented at uh, Hutnets or something like that? Oh, yeah, that Nick McEwen's. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. It, was a, it may have been a, a chalk talk. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go look at the Hotnet proceedings and see if it's in there. That would okay. be great. Be I, I know you've mentioned it in the past, and I think I've, gone, I've tried to find it, but I haven't been successful. So. Um, any other comments from anybody else? Okay, so, I'm trying to figure out how to stop. Okay, so I'll stop sharing, okay? Uh, maybe you just want to put the last slide just uh, that I had just to conclude. Okay, let me grab that again. Share that again. This is good. I've never had to share stuff in um, WebEx before, so this is good. I'm learning. Okay, so um, I think I've, I've taken a number of action items. One of them is to make sure that we share all these ideas uh, for the hackathon uh, for um, March 21-22. Uh, as far as the active, new, and um, expired drafts, I'm going to make sure that um, I contact uh, the, the authors of at least the Dirk Trossen one to make sure to see how this is going to go forward or if it's going to be abandoned. Uh, I'm going to work with Alessandro on the use case for agriculture. I will contact the um, Ericsson research people as well as the people from Intel Germany about this common data layer that was defined more or less uh, both in discussions for the, I, uh, the EU proposal but also a lot of it on, on side meetings that we had and also that involved Dirk uh, Kutner. Actually, it's very funny to have two Dirks in the same group. So it's Dirk T and Dirk K. So this one at Dirk K. Um, and uh, we'll obviously use all of this to uh, define agenda items and talks. Um, we already know, by the way, that there will not be potentially anyone from Huawei or from China Mobile in Vancouver, I just got another email while we were, while Eve was talking. So uh, we will make sure to have a lot of remote participation possible, so that we don't lose the um, collective, uh, you know, intelligence and the collective research from, from China. And uh, and hopefully people will be tuning in remotely if the time thing, permits it. And, and I think for them. Um, Vancouver is not that bad, actually. It's, it's um, I think it's nine hours, not 12, like if we were on the East Coast. So, you know, it's feasible. It's like you, Eve, when you communicate with, with Europe. 
Um, so I, I think there's potential for for participation, and I'm even thinking that if it gets to this, um, we could even have them record their presentations and just play it back. Um, obviously, it means that all questions would be then taken down and sent remote, you know, sent at a later time. But I think we have to make sure that we allow people to, you know, to participate as much as they can. Um, I also know that out of um, the NetProc, we're going to also contact a few people. Um, there's, um, um, you know, ways of also having more presentations. As you know, the Cambridge group in the UK is extremely um, active on all kinds of related things. Um, I also can know- you tell us, Can you tell us, um, uh, how are we faring with regards to, like, do we have certain topics approved already and time plus spoken for, and so we know we no. only have X amount of space left? No, no. so nothing's been, okay. All nothing right, just done. checking. Um, All right. I say, call for agenda item and talks. I, I think uh, you, Eve, and Jeff, when he feels better, should start working on the agenda. But for the moment, I kind of call it like a call for agenda items. There's nothing. Perfect. Um, Planned, except for, for obviously the people who have the active um, the active drafts obviously should be given a chance of presenting, but um, the rest is is wide open right now. Okay. And um, yeah, and, and I think yeah, we're I think we're going to have still a lot of stuff, and uh, but I think with two sessions uh, we should be um, we should be good. Um, so hold on, there's somebody at the door here. I need to go. Uh, so maybe now is the time to say goodbye. So yeah. before we say goodbye, I pasted, okay, some, I pasted some links into the chat room for Nick's paper and a couple of these fingerprinting papers. Oh, okay. So then I will not uh, disconnect until I grab them. Yeah, the, the two fingerprinting papers, it's not quite obvious that they're related. So think about them a bit because they, okay. they had a different purpose. But so the hard part is getting the underlying algorithms for data similarity right, right? And that's the hard part, not the networking part. Yes, I totally agree, which is why software-defined, you know, computations, like, well, how do you figure out what your, how long that computation is going to take if you're, if you're dynamically loading different computations in or if similarity is, you know, an yep. order of magnitude uh, takes longer because there's so many more things in the frame or, you know, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of variables. Right. And, and at least one of the papers, the algorithms are offline algorithms. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, but the other one, the video one, I think was the intent was to be able to do it at least at user interaction rates. Good. Okay. Okay. And um, thank you very much. So I recorded it. So I will be able to send this to, to, uh, uh, Jeffrey, and I think this is the last question, Jeffrey, um, I find there. Uh, it's probably not very easy right now in Shenzhen, so. Um, thank you, everybody, you know. for, for joining the session. And, yeah, and thank you, everybody. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think I can express my own, uh, you know, my own sentiments here. This is going really well, and, you know, it's, blossoming and it's really cool and thank you everyone for being there we had i think a very good cross-section of of the uh, skills in this meeting although it was small and I, I think we need to continue the work so thank you so very much and thank you to eve for being a uh the early bird <laughs> i hope you, you catch the word. <laughs> uh, it's okay all worth it thank you everybody okay have a good now, bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks and bye. Marisha, say I'm going to stay online if you.